Dear Professor Oh Chang Hun, dear former president of Korea University Ikisu, Chongyeon Han Yorobun, Annyeonghashimika, Pangapsundida. I am happy to be here at Korea University to deliver a speech to your course, or let's say to have a discussion perhaps on on Korea and Germany, what is life in Germany like? How did Germany de develop to the kind of country that it is today? But rather than giving a talk which would be about figures uh, and facts, I would rather want to explain the development of the society and to explain the development of the society, perhaps the best approach may be to choose the own family. So I decided in proposing a travel, a journey through the three generations, the generation of my parents, of myself, and of my children. You may have seen or uh, followed the visit recently of President Park Geun-hye to Germany, where the big issue she raised was unification of Germany and whether it was Tebak, whether it was a success story. And, uh, we always ask, what does Tebak mean? And uh, if Tebak means it, was, it brought happiness to the people of Germany, then we would say yes. After 25 years, we can say it has been Tebak. If you ask whether it brought a fortune from one day to another, we would say, well, that is overly optimistic. First, you will need to pay, and then you will earn. So let me... Let me, or a second point, since I arrived here, and especially since President Park Geun-hye took office at Germany in many areas, to a kind of benchmark for the development of Korea, whether it's economic issues, whether it is democracy or economic democratization, as it's called here, or uh, whether it is, for example, hidden champions, or let's say social affairs. And in this discussion, the focus is always much too heavily on the economic side. And the focus tends to leave aside what labor relations are like in Germany, what the role of women is like in Germany, and how society developed since the 1950s until today, which is the basis for what we see as a success story today. So, in going through, I would propose to go through three generations. The first generation on the left side, that's the generation of my parents, very conservative, uh, but at the same time building up the country from 1949. This is when Germany as West Germany was uh, founded and East Germany, the GDR, was founded until 1969. And then in the middle, the second part of the development from 69 to, six to 89, which is basically my generation. And the third generation, my, my children's generation, this is from the soccer championship uh, 2006. That is Germany after reunification. I think a quick look at the facts is necessary. This is a picture of Germany and you will see the main places that I would mention during the presentation, namely Berlin, Dresden, this is the place that uh, the President Park and Hedge just visited, Bonn, that was the seat of uh, the government before unification, Mannheim, which is the place where my wife was born, and Bruxelles, that is close to the French border, this is where I am actually born. Now, if you look Germany in general, you can see that with the exception of Switzerland, Germany is surrounded by the European Union. We can now say that together uh, with Czech Republic and Austria, this is more or less geographically speaking the center of the European Union. And in that sense, Germany today is a country that is surrounded by friends and by very close partners. The first generation, my father's generation, the people that have still seen the war 
and that were born like in the 1930s. When the war was over, this was the picture they were surrounded with. This is, oh, I'm sorry. This is what Berlin looked, what Dresden looked like. This is what Dresden looked like. It was all burned down to ruins. This is Mannheim, it was all with ruins. This is Berlin, this is Berlin. So this is the country that this generation started to build up after World War II, which may be not too far away from the situation which you had in Korea after uh, the, the Korean War. So during this period, at the beginning, Germany was separated in, three, in four different zones, the Russian zone, the British, the French, and the American zone. And only in 49, these four, three Western zones became West Germany, and the Soviet zone became East Germany. So the two countries were separated. Now, during this time, the two major foreign policy decisions that were taken on the West German side were, on one hand, to become part of the, to found and become part of the Western organizations, to go for integration into the West. And that meant, on one hand, reconciliation with France. And uh, this picture is showing Konrad Adenauer and here de Gaulle and Adenauer in the Reims Cathedral when they signed the Elysee Treaty which was the most important early treaty for Germany in order to become friend, closest friend, with our immediate neighbor, which we attacked during World War II, namely France. The second most important development was the foundation of the European Union. And here you see the signature of the Treaties of Rome in 1957. So for West Germany, the first 20 years from 49 to 69 in political terms, in foreign policy terms, were clearly determined by integrating West Germany into uh, the Western Hemisphere. The third element, except for France, European Union, or European communities at the time, the third element was NATO, joining NATO. During this time, there was one big setback, and that was in 1961, when the GDR and the Russians decided to build the Berlin Wall. This is in August 1961. The two Germanys were separated into two countries before, but only in 1961, from one day to the other, the Iron Curtain was built up first in Berlin and then through the rest of the country. And from one day to another, people were not allowed to see their families in the other half of Berlin anymore. So within one night, people and families were separated without having had any idea that this would happen uh, immediately before. Now, during this period, during these 20 years, there was only one credo, one thing that people were working for and believed in, and that was rebuilding the country from the ashes of war. And in that sense, people worked hard. People usually worked six, we six uh, days a week. People not only worked for their regular work, but very often they, in the evening, they helped to rebuild the country or they, they had uh, their own agriculture. Where on Sundays, they had agriculture where they tried to, to cultivate uh, the food they would eat during the week. So after all, it was very, very tough and hard time. But at the same time, it was a period where people wanted to enjoy, start enjoying their life again. They all had seen uh, eight years of war. And so they didn't want to see any criticism about what's happening. They didn't want to see any discussion of the cruelties, the crimes committed during the Nazi time. They wouldn't want to discuss the Holocaust. They wouldn't want, they, they wanted nice songs. They wanted cinema, which is all about the happiness of life. And the kind of dress, the kind of behavior 
was very conservative, very family oriented, and uh, also with the religion still playing a very strong role in, um, in the country. During this time, for example, when people were talking about communism in West Germany, and now I'm always speaking about West Germany until unification, since I have never been to the East before, except for East Berlin before unification. So, for example, if we were talking about communism in former West Germany during this period, uh, you would be an outcast, an outlaw. The, com the party, which was a communist party at that time that existed in West Germany, uh, that was forbidden by the Constitutional Court with the argument that it would destabilize the rule of the country. If you would have sh skirts that were too short, people wouldn't accept. But Ari, the whole, con the whole society was very much on work, work and easy enjoying life. The year that was, that was very much understandable, since people had suffered a very difficult period, and they were very successful during these first 16 or 18 years of rebuilding the country. And the person that stands for this whole period was Konrad Adenauer. He was chancellor for 14 years, but in reality he dominated the first 20 years of politics in Germany. And it was the, the country of the conservative or the uh, Christian Democrat Party. Then the next phase basically started with 1969 until, 19, until 1989. And that was a completely different picture of the country. Now the country basically was rebuilt, my generation, we started at a moment, or let's say the people in the mid-1960s, um, for the first time in Germany there was what you call a grand coalition, that once the two biggest parties together were ruling, which is something that people are very surprised about here, that Senuri party could go into government together with the Democratic Party. So that happened for, in Germany for the first time in 1966. And it was necessary to change the constitution, you needed a big majority. And so this is what the two big parties did. In order to pass emergency laws, they formed a coalition together. But at the same time, the young people, they didn't want to live in this kind of strict, conservative, orderly environment. And also they started to have independent political ideas. And this first exploded, so to speak, in demonstrations against the regime of the Shah of Iran. At that time, many people, like 100,000 people of, of, from, from Persia, were living in Germany. And it started uh, as demonstrations against the Vietnam War, just as you had it in the United States. So this period of 1966, 68, 69, the big change, if you look at the people, these are people from, from a community in Berlin, and if you look at the pictures which we have seen from the Germans before, there is a very big difference. So people wanted to go for personal freedom, personal liberty, and for independence. And a person, a people were starting to question the history of their parents and to question the continuity which to some extent had existed between, with some people from the Nazi regime continuing under uh, the, the West German uh, democracy. Um, so typical during this area were demonstrations in the streets, in this case demonstrations for stu in, for, uh, by students, mostly against Shah regime, against Vietnam War, and later I come to other elements. From the foreign policy perspective, the big change came with Willy Brandt, and that was what is called the East politic. So that was the kind what now is proposed as trust politic in Korea. That was the policy that was trying to change the relationship with, our, uh, with East Germany, but with all partners in Eastern Europe, through a consistent 
approach of cooperation, which was called change through rapprochement. And during this period, we did treaties with Russia, with Soviet Union at the time, Poland, Czech Republic, and with East Germany in order to build a new friendship and new relationship with these countries. A prerequisite for this was a picture which is quite famous here in Korea, namely reconciliation with Poland. And this is Willy Brandt, I'm oh, sorry, this is Willy Brandt at the Warsaw Ghetto when he was kneeling uh, in order to uh, ask for pardon from all Polish people and of course especially Polish people that suffered under the Holocaust. That was in 1972. So the big, the phase from 69 to 72 was basically about building our relations with Eastern Europe and building our relations, making the Iron Curtain permeable, having more and more exchange between West German people and East German people, a development which in the end resulted in German unification. If you look at the society, this is only like 10 years later than the pictures you have shown before about the first TV and about the um, conservative-looking uh, um, middle-class society. In my generation, the students and uh, many young people, they wanted a new form of democracy to some extent. They were arguing against, first of all, against nuclear energy. So the, the anti-nuclear uh, uh, energy movement started in the mid-70s and they were arguing also against nuclear disarmament and uh, nuclear armament. In that time, there was both the Russians and the Americans, both Warsaw Pact and NATO, wanted to deploy new medium-range missiles along the border on the western side and on the eastern side of Germany. So actually, most of us, we became specialists in nuclear reactor technology and in trajectories of, of medium-range ballistic missiles. And um, the Germany as the country who actually was one of the first to have nuclear reactors, it was very surprising that we should be the first ones that would not accept that kind of energy anymore. But there were a number of reasons of it. One was that people tried to build a reprocessing facility and it was not possible to find any place in Germany where the population would accept a reprocessing facility due to the consequences that this could have for the environment. Secondly, there were attempts to find a place where you could store nuclear waste uh, on a long-term basis and all the attempts to find a place were more or, less, more or less failed. But the government, of course, wanted to find solutions as quick as possible. And so there was a long discussion and a long process of negotiation and of demonstrations, sometimes quite wild demonstrations, between the anti-nuclear energy movement and the government. And there is a big lesson from these times, which is that actually the government behaved in a very liberal way and our parents behaved in a very liberal way. And they allowed the country to develop this kind of culture of protest, this kind of culture of demonstration. So the police always was very careful. Uh, they were very careful. They allowed, uh, it took a long time before they would really use force against demonstrations. And so in this sense, it was possible over a longer term to also build up new political forces in the country. This is another example where the, the younger generation, they were protesting about a new landing uh, line, lane for the Frankfurt airport, which is in, in the meantime has been built. But it took like 20 years since for almost 10 years this was blocked by demonstrations and by the courts given the protest of the, of the uh, population and of younger people against uh, such kind of a facility in very close to the center of a city. 
Again, another example is the, the protest against the deployment of new medium-range nuclear missiles. And this, here, this is a human chain that ran for, um, let's see, I think for 100, 120 kilometers through the country. So people were standing hand by hand for about 120 kilometers throughout the country in order to protest against deployment of, uh, of new uh, medium-range missiles. And actually, again, I should say that the government and the courts and the society was very open in accepting these kind of protests and very open to accept a full-scale discussion both in parliament and outside of parliament. If you look from it from a today's perspective, those that protested against the deployment of nuclear weapons, like myself, were wrong. Since the willingness by the West to deploy nuclear weapons, combined with the proposal to negotiate with the Soviet Union, led to a situation where both sides gave up their plans. So actually the government was right in saying we are ready to deploy if negotiations fail. If you look on the other side, on the case of nuclear energy, there it turned out that the attitude of those that protested um, actually gained and gained and gained more votes within the country. And at one point in the late last century, finally the majority of German people were against nuclear energy. A third political, very important political movement during this time was the women movement. It was the fight against uh, a very restricted uh, paragraph on, on punishing abortion for women. It was the fight for a new law about divorce, which gave women a much better, which put women into a much better situation than it was before 1975. So the women movement, the anti-nuclear energy and the uh, anti-nuclear weapons movement more or less were three key elements of, let's say, the social, uh, the society development. And it led actually to the founding of a new party, which is the Ecologist or the Green Party. Whilst the 1968 period in the United States or in France or in other countries just disappeared again after a couple of years, in Germany it led to a full-scale democratic party movement, namely the Green Party, and suddenly you could see uh, here on the right side a minister which is sworn in as a minister at the state parliament of Hessen with his uh, sneakers on. <laughs> and, uh, and here three of the founding members of the Green Party, which is later Foreign Minister Fischer, I don't know, you may, you may have heard of him, he became a great European after all, Petra Kelly, who was a, an American a German, and a former general. So these three people, more or less, were the key people which founded the Green Party. And uh, that was quite far away from the kind of way how you would see a deputy in parliament before that period. There were also very negative elements. And one of is that, that the, the, this overall movement had some excesses. And one is was that there was a group of students and others that started to argue that they have to topple the government by violent means. And so, it, unfortunately, there was also one terrorist movement which started within the country, which used or abused the liberalism of the country. And they killed some people, they seducted key or abducted key uh, economy people like the chief of the German bank, for example, whom you see here. But overall, this whole 20 years, on one hand, between West and East Germany, it led to the Iron Curtain grumbling slowly but steadily. And within West Germany, it really led to a different kind of society, to very open society, to a society where people individually had a lot of freedom but at the same time to society where women gained more rights and also where 
in terms of labor relations, many laws were passed which allows the labor representatives and the workers to participate in the management of the factory or to participate at the management of the company, which is what we call, what was called here, economic democratization. So all these developments taken together were very important in mastering the future challenges, or in this case, better to say, the future debacle of the country, namely, and this is uh, the end of 1989, this is the time when people in East Germany in their Monday demonstration said, we, want, we are the people and we want one new Germany, and that is a united Germany. With this, I come to the third part. As you may easily guess, the third part is the generation of my children. And uh, so this is a family picture. I, as someone mentioned, uh, we have five boys. So it's a bit one-sided. My presentation is a bit one-sided. I'm not so familiar with the perspective of uh, the female young generation <laughs> as I am with the male young generation. This is from, from last year from Chichu Island. Um, but in any case, my, my kids are born in 1988, 1990, 1991, 1994, and 1996. Uh, so, <laughs> and uh, so in that sense, uh, I'm actually quite still up to date on, uh, on uh, how things are. But let me just, I forgot that point, let me just explain in my personal case of what it meant to be part of my generation. I studied law first in Heidelberg and then later in Berlin. I perhaps I would have been, and for example, if you study and your, peop, your parents are middle class, in Germany you receive subsidies by the government. You receive, uh, let's say, like one million, one million won. You receive one million won every month as a subsidy from the government. But it's not one million won subsidy, it is like 600,000 won as a, um, as a loan, which you have to pay back, and 400,000 won as a subsidy by the government. Or if your people, parents are a bit richer, it depends on the income of the parents, but usually middle class people would receive, the students will, they don't have to pay, or they have to pay very little fee to the university and they can receive from the government this kind of assistance which is partially loan and partially it is, uh, it is a real subsidy. And so I received that for four years uh, since I didn't want to finish my studies after four years and I didn't get money from my parents, I started together with some friends a taxi company. So we, I studied law at the same time, Saturdays and Sunday nights, or Friday and Saturday nights. We worked in our own company. Of course, we started a company where the owners would also be the drivers. So if you wanted to drive in our company, you could drive for half a year. And then you had to decide whether you become member of the company or shareholder or not. So I kept studying for a fairly long time. Uh, and, uh, and at the same time earning my money and running a company which was very interesting since you, you could understand much better of how the system is working. So as a student when I was 21 years old every year we bought a big Mercedes Benz for our company and that was no real problem. Then later after finishing my studies when I applied to become a prosecutor they asked me, of course you need, a good, you need among the top 10%, otherwise you will not become prosecutor. But otherwise they didn't care that I had studied, I think, for almost six years. Uh, but they were very interested, oh, you ran a company, this is very good, so you can become a prosecutor for white collar crime. You know how to read the balance sheet of a company. I said, yes, of course I know how to know the balance sheet. And so I, I had a job very easily, and it was only upon performance uh, it was not about, well, this guy has not been very active uh, in terms of studying. It took a long time of studying. If you look at the living conditions, for example, uh, before in the 1950s, 60s, people were very, uh, they lived with their, at home or they lived in a student dormitory. Now, when I was in Berlin, we lived in a community. Though we had one big apartment together, it was like 
350 square meters, and six of us rent this apartment together. And, but usually, like 10 people were living there, or sometimes 12, or sometimes 8. We always had dinner together, so I was supposed to do dinner for one week. I was a reasonable cook. So when people knew I would do the dinner, you would not have six or eight, sometimes you had 14 people coming in for the dinner. So it was a completely different kind of studying, a different kind of environment. It was a very liberal environment, if I may say so. And what I personally found fascinating, for example, when I applied in the Ministry of Justice of uh, my state, I went there and I had a green leather jacket, I wore a green leather jacket, which I had bought in the flea market in Paris. And the guy looked at me, he was a bit surprised, but it, it was not interesting for him. So you, had, you didn't have to carry your diplomatic bag and come with a nice suit and so on. What counted was the kind of personality and it was your performance. And so they gave me the job and not the others that came with a diplomatic bag. I don't think this will happen anymore today. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it was the kind of attitude or experience that you could have during this period of time. Now, the next generation, my kids' generation, they have a tougher life than I, I must admit. And uh, the first, so they, they were born more or less around unification. They were born more or less around unification. And that meant for the country as a whole, for the first couple of months, a very big excitement. Even for economy, it meant a very big push forward, since there was a lot of infrastructure to build in East Germany. But over the years, and towards the late 1990s and the early years of this century, it became more and more difficult to maintain our competitiveness globally. It became more and more difficult to control state finances, since we had to pay all the costs of unification of infrastructure, but especially all the costs of absorbing, of, of applying our highly developed social security system to all people in East Germany that have never paid into this kind of system. And so, until 2003, it became more and more, I would say, tougher and tougher also for the younger generation to get into university it became tougher and tougher there were many students and not so many places so you needed already in school my nightmare about school is that i did not get uh, the final admission to the final exam in the end since i had been away from school too often uh, which was not the case only to some extent i would say <laughs> but um, but so the attitude was usually the last week of school, I didn't like it anymore, so I went, I worked as a construction worker in order to earn money. Or the last year, it was boring in school, so I usually I went to the university uh, to attend courses. Uh, and no one did really bother very much as long as you had excellent marks, which is very different from what school is nowadays and what it was like in this for, our, for my children's generation where you have to be competitive again. You have to be competitive in order to get interesting places at university and in order to get interesting jobs afterwards. So basically the main event that guided German development from 1989 until now, the main element is German unification. And the second element is this one. It's not money in general, it is the establishment of the euro, the introduction of the euro in the year 1999 and then 2000, which means that in all of the eurozone, which is the core of the European Union, we are now using the same kind of currency, namely, oh, I'm always missing up, mixing up, namely the euro instead of the German mark. For my children, I still keep calculating in German marks. Even when I find something expensive, I think, well, what would that have been in German marks? I think, oh my gosh, this is double as much. Whilst my children have no idea what the German mark was all about. The same, I always keep comparing 
well, we always still speak of West Germans and East Germans. My children don't make any difference anymore between East Germans and West Germans. For them, it is only one Germany. And for them also, it is very normal not to see them only as Germans, but also as Europeans. Each of them usually would study in Germany, but would spend half a year or one year in another European country. You can travel throughout Europe without having to show your passport, which is part of the Schengen area. So you are, you are living not only in one country, but you are living on half of a continent, which is changing the perception, which is changing the mentality of young people, and that is, I think, very necessary. Now, this generation, on one hand, they have a tougher life. On the other hand, Germany and the mentality of the country has changed after unification. Not in the first years. Germany, in many senses, reminded me, or now having come to Korea, I thought in many respects that Korea is very similar to Germany before unification. Not in what I have shown about my generation and about demonstrations and about personal liberty, but in terms of eagerness to be number one, in, in terms of, uh, of high performance, in terms of perfection, perfectionism, and in terms of a tendency of discontent. You were never, we were never content in ourselves. We were never quiet. We were always nervous. We always wanted to be better and better and better and better. And we also didn't really see our, well, in political terms, actually, we were never happy with this small Germany uh, either. Rather, we thought we are, well, we are part of, of big Europe. And so many of our neighbors, they thought, we don't trust you. We don't trust Germany. You have to confess to your nation state. Otherwise, we think what you try is a takeover of the European Union. And so, after unification, the feeling has changed very much. Not during the first 10 years, but Germany now is a much quieter and much more self-satisfied country, and also, I would say, a happier country than the divided Germany has been before. Certainly, this is the case for, let's say, my uh, the, the best Germany that I, think, that I know very well, but I think for most part of East Germany, not for all, but for most part, this, this is also the case. And some of these pictures that would somehow indicate what the picture of Germany nowadays, on the left hand is the Laugh Parade in Berlin, which has been one of the main parties in Europe for, I think, um, almost a decade. And on the right side, you see the Soccer Championship 2006, which 17 years after unification, or 16 years after unification, was the first real party of a united Germany, where both in the West and the East, it was one big party, and Germany lost in the, in the semi-finals already. So that should have been a disaster. And for former West Germany, it would have been a disaster. I'm sure for former East Germany, it would have been a disaster. But the new United Germany, they were just happy. They were just happy to have the soccer championship, and they were happy to be only third in the tournament, and they had the biggest party that Germany had ever seen. And suddenly, also, the perception of Germany from abroad changed. Even the British suddenly found, well, the Germans can party without win. And uh, if you look at the recent polls, for example, from BBC to, uh, last year, you will see that within Europe and even beyond, Germany seems to have the highest marks in terms of which country do you appreci appreciate most or which country has the best image from your perspective. That was never the case for, United, for, for divided Germany. But now, apparently, people are more relaxed and perhaps also uh, more open. And this is why we are arriving at such a positive uh, image. I have shown you at the beginning pictures of Dresden, of Berlin, of Mannheim, and you saw it was all ruins. Now this is what it looks like today. This is Berlin, the center of Berlin, Potsdamer Platz. This is Dresden. 
which was absolutely burned down to ashes in 1945, and which is now again one of the most beautiful cities that you can find in Europe. And here, this is the president, Parkenhe, when she visited Frauenkirche. This church was down. It was really absolute, there was nothing left except for stones. And they collected all these stones again and they rebuilt it. But it was not rebuilt with government money. It was all rebuilt with donations from, from private persons and from companies. Oops. Here you see the castle of Mannheim. Here this, you see the castle of Bruchsal. This is where I'm born. This place was ruins after the Second World War. The whole city was completely bombarded since it was an infrastructure center. So out of this, you, up to here, up to here you had something. The rest was all ruins. And uh, so this is, is what, what Germany is, is today. And that is a very, very long way that we went from uh, the 1949 until today. But I should say that still, on one hand, Germany is very competitive. And we have undergone very deep reforms within the last 10 years. Reforms about of our social system, reforms of labor relations, Reforms which really hurt, especially uh, the middle and the lower class. And in most other countries, these kind of reforms would have caused major strike, general strike, for month or for half a year, so it would have blocked the country. But in Germany, it did not. In Germany, people accepted for seven or eight years no increase at all in their wages and they accepted a cut in the social system. And there were no demonstrations about it. And the question is why? And the reason is the whole period before. The reason is that democracy had developed in a way where people believed in the validity of the, of the government system and if the dem of the democratic system. And also the labor relations had developed in a way where workers and their representatives would have a right in co-determining what is happening at a factory level and would also, in the big companies, have a say in the management of the companies. And so people, workers, started to have a co-responsibility for what is happening in their uh, company. And this is why, overall, all these very difficult reforms were accepted by the population, which brought us back from the sick men of Europe in 2003 to the locomotive of Europe in the year 2013. But still, we are facing in some elements, some aspects, similar problems like Korea. And one of these problems is demography, where if you compare the situation in 1950, people here at the age of, of between 10 and 20 and 14 to 50 represented the majority of the population. Whilst in the year 2060, the majority of the population will be between 70 and 80 years old. And that, of course, will be a big challenge for society and for the social system. And so what we are witnessing now is that Germany is becoming an immigration country, that every year we have about one million foreigners going to Germany in order to stay in Germany. And we need that. Last, or oh, two years ago, was the first time that we could keep our population stable. And the reason was that we had 350,000 more foreigners moving into Germany and working in Germany than leaving the country. And that is the minimum which we will need in the future in order to maintain stable, so uh, to maintain economic growth and in order to maintain a stable system. But this is a very big challenge to integrate roughly one million people every year. We had that already in the early 1990s when at the peak 
after unification when, when Germans from Russia and Germans from Eastern Europe and also refugees from the former Yugoslavia came to West Germany. We had in one year 1.6 million uh, immigrants with a population of 80 million. So this is a very, very big uh, number. And this caused quite some trouble for mm, 10, 15 years. Now we are in a situation after long discussion that people start accepting that in order to maintain the economic level and in order to maintain the social stability of the country, we will need something like 300, 400,000 uh, immigrants every year. At the moment, we are quite happy since there are so many people from Spain, from Italy, from Greece, but also from Poland, most of all from, from Poland, coming to Germany which are, since they are Europeans, can be integrated uh, quite easily and actually which contribute very heavily to our society. But it took a very long time. It took a very long time until population accepted that Germany has to develop into an immigration country. And I should also say that all these liberal developments which we had from 69 to 89 and all the challenges of, let's say, high competitiveness uh, for industry and high competitiveness for skilled workers and so on. All of this also led to changes in the society with some negative effects. For example, the conservative society in the 1950s and 60s, they had 10% of divorce. Today, we have 46% of divorces in the society. And as a consequence, of course, you have many children which grow up only with one parent, or as we have it in Berlin now, and my children were so surprised when they realized that, you have many patchwork families. You know what patchwork family is? No? Patchwork family means you have the father, and he has one child from his first marriage. You have the mother, she has one child from the first marriage, and then they have, may, may have one child together. So uh, they have three or four children all together, but from three different combinations. And uh, this is something that you could not have imagined uh, 20 years ago. And we were, before uh, I was stayed in Germany for, from 2005 to 2012, we came back from Tokyo at the time. So when my children went to school, they didn't understand what's going on there since they came from a class, traditional family, five children, my, my wife has never been working. So uh, a very, you could say in principle, a very conservative setting. And suddenly they found out their friends, half of them, either there was only the, with the mother or they were only with the father, or there was a very nice kind of patchwork arrangement. And the children spent one vacation with the father, the next vacation with the mother, and then sometimes perhaps uh, in, in different scenarios. So, so there is a very, the way how to integrate this kind of, of society now is very difficult. One other element is the society of the 1960s, 50s was very much like the Korean society in terms of respect of the elderly, in terms of discipline, in terms of working very tough and very focused. Whilst, as you have seen, the middle period from 69 to 89, it was more very liberal. We respected our parents to the extent that it was indispensable, but perhaps not more than that. Uh, we respected professors to the extent that they may have been convincing, but not more than that, not for the reason that they were a professor. If they were not convincing, they had no authority. So, to, and also the, the respect for, pub, for private property. If you go to Berlin, you will see many of the, in, in Kreuzberg, for example, in the areas where many young people live, you will see many of the walls of the houses with spray, sprayed with arts, or sometimes only with, uh, let's say, uh, with writings. Now, this was, at one time, perhaps acceptable, when this movement started like 25 or 30 years ago, 
when there was some art around it. But now houses are nicely renovated and the next morning, once they are renovated, you will find them sprayed all over. So of course this is not acceptable anymore. This was a specific period. So there also there's a necessity to come back from too much, let's say, too much freedom, too much liberty, too much individualism, to a situation where you start to respect more, again, authorities, parents, and public property. And in that sense, actually, I always would recommend German pupils to go to Korea for one year and Koreans to go to Germany to have the opposite experience for one year, since I believe this would make a very nice combination. And what Germany stands for today basically is modern technologies. And as I mentioned before, these reforms in 2003, which would in most countries have led to a general strike. If you look at the decisions that Germany has taken on energy transition, namely to do away with nuclear energy by the year 2022. So the last nuclear reactor will be shut down in 2022. All our neighbors, everyone else in the world told us you are simply crazy. Maybe they are right. But after all, there is a clear majority in Germany in favor of this decision. And this is now a real challenge. This is a real challenge that the country hopefully will master. And if we master it, then we are a world leader in modern technology as far as energy is concerned. And also a world leader in terms of organizing democratic, democratic processes. Since the difficult issue is not to produce energy, even without any nuclear plan, already now we are producing a surplus of energy. Since so much renewable energy has been installed and energy efficiency it has been reducing the energy demand by a considerable degree. The big challenge is distribution. The big challenge are the energy autobahn, the, the, the grid that you have to build up. Now, if you want to build the grid, then you have to open either the floor or you have to do it along, uh, uh, along the houses, along, along the roads and so on. People don't like that. So they don't suddenly want to have all this energy, uh, uh, current energy grid uh, next to their houses all over the place, big, big energy autobahn through the country. So it will be very interesting to see whether democracy is ripe enough, is mature enough, that the people most affected will, will accept for the sake of the interests of the country as a whole, that they will accept this kind of big energy lines going through the country from north to south in order to see the big, uh, the big process running, which is energy transition. And in that sense, on one hand, Germany is top on modern technologies, but again, coming back to the 1980s, Germany has also, is also a very mature democracy, and people don't accept very easily what the government decides. For example, what we have seen before with Andy Nuclear, this is the city of Stuttgart where they want to build, where they want to build a new train station. This train station is supposed to be underground and as a consequence the lines also, when the train lines will also go underground. Now this project has been running for 15 years now. The planning has been running for 15 years. Still, it is not, it is not materializing. And when one prime minister tried to more or less do it by force, then the normal citizens from this, uh, which is the capital of Baden-Württemberg, the normal citizens, the shop owners, the company owners, they started to go to the streets and protest. So if you, if you look at the people here, this lady or this man or these people, they are all normal conservative citizens in the richest region of Germany that take their right of democracy and after going back from work in the evening they went to demonstrate every evening. And so after a long difficult period they decided to elect a mayor from the environmentalist party, the Green Party, and the prime minister from this state is from the Green Party. So the, rich, the richest state of, of, uh, in the country now has a green government, ecology government, and the richest city as a green mayor, which is a very surprising since this always has been a very 
conservative, um, a very conservative uh, society. And it means that some of the big infrastructure projects, which are done here within one or two years, in Germany they take 20 years, and democracy make, does make it necessary to delay decisions, to rediscuss, to rediscuss. Discussions about this, discussion about this project from experts has been shown for two weeks daily on the TV, so every citizen could watch the full explanation of experts in favor of against this project. And many, many people in this area visited. And in the end, they decided in favor of the project. It was a long democratic process, sometimes violent, which took many, many years, but it will take to a decision which is then accepted by all. But it takes a lot of time, and that means it will become difficult for us to organize our infrastructure as quickly as Korea is doing it, for example. So Germany today, I would say, the, it's the country of ideas, it's the country of patents, it's the country of high technology. And to show one example, which is not promotion, but an example of how we see the German-Korean relationship going is the car that was introduced last week in Korea, which is a German-Korean joint venture in the sense that it's the greenest car in the world. It has been awarded the greenest car in the world. It's the first purely electrical car. The car is, from, is German, namely BMW, but the batteries are from Samsung SDI. So this clearly is a kind of German-Korean high-tech cooperation, which we hope will be the future of our relationship. And in that sense, let me stop here. Thank you for your attention. And I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you. Thank Please. <laughs> generous to refugee, uh, accept refugees. And um, actually, just my question is why you're very generous to accept refugees and how it affects your population? I mean, does it affect your population? Could you, could you use the microphone? Why? Just the question. Uh, okay. Okay, should I repeat again? The question, yes. Uh, okay. so, so how does refugee policy, your refugee policy, affect your population? And because, as far as I know, Germany is very generous to accept refugees. And, um, yeah, so I think this is in fact in negative ways or in uh, positive ways. Um. It's, it's a fairly difficult question if I want to, to, uh, to respond properly. The German um, legislation is indeed fairly open as far as uh, re political refugees are concerned. And I think we are talking up here about political refugees and asylum seekers. Um, so the, the treatment, uh, the kind of subsidies that they, they will get when they arrive in Germany is compared to other countries is relatively open. At the same time, we are now in a privileged situation since, as you have seen in the picture, Germany is now in the middle of Europe and around you will see other European member states. So when a refugee asylum seeker will arrive in Europe, he will arrive in France or in Spain or in Greece or in the Czech Republic, but not in Germany. And according to the regulations within uh, the European Union, the so-called Dublin II regulation, the country where the refugee is arriving is the country that's responsible for dealing with him. So in that sense, Germany is now in a fairly, in a fairly um, <laughs> pleasant situation, you could say. Um, but if you look from a longer-term perspective, we have always been very open to political asylum seekers for the simple reason 
that Germany herself during the Second World War, many Germans went abroad, many Germans went to Switzerland, many Germans went to Brazil, they went to United States and, re and, and received asylum. And so we had a, a responsibility in that sense. But then during the early 1990s, we were really flooded uh, and that was mainly true to the wars in the former Republic of Yugoslavia. We were flooded with refugees. We were flooded from pe with people that were German by origin from Eastern Europe. We were flooded with refugees from uh, former Yugoslavia. And on top of that, you had asylum seekers coming from Iran, for example, or coming from, from African countries. And that led to a situation where during most of the 1990s, the, um, the attitude of, of German citizens became rather critical since we felt we would not be able to manage it anymore. So right now, on one hand, we are still fairly liberal. On the other hand, we are in a privileged situation since uh, most of the asylum seekers would not apply in Germany, but rather in our neighboring countries. Uh, yes, I would like to ask you about, uh, you were mentioning the issue to attract more people to, to Germany. So, um, and the first thing I can come to think about is public diplomacy and how, <laughs> I would not use this one, but um, how, the, uh, uh, how the German embassy or the, or the German a foreign, foreign ministry is working with public diplomacy around the world. I should say that we are, <laughs> we, tend, we tend to think that uh, German products and German philosophy uh, uh, and, uh, is, is attractive uh, and that the public diplomacy in the way how the British or the Americans are, are doing it in order to advertise to, for their country. Some, some um, campaigns we have done, like what, what I have shown before, this Germany land of ideas. Um, but otherwise, we are, rather, we are rather careful about public diplomacy in a general sense. We, we rather believe that the country must speak for itself. Uh, the universities must speak for themselves, the quality of education, the quality of studies, the quality of our products. Um, of course, we are advising for, advertising for tourism, but uh, for me it's quite interesting to see that public diplomacy now is a big issue here in Korea. Um, we have never made this one of our, we have never put a strong emphasis on that actually. And here in Korea, for example, if, I, if I'm looking around, if, if you look at music or culture, then we see that there is hardly any place in the world outside Germany except for Tokyo, where you will find as much German music and classical music as here in Seoul. Uh, and the, the, the audience is roughly 10 to 15 years younger than the audience would be in Germany. And uh, without doing much from our own side, we have realized that there are many more articles here about Germany in the press than about any other European country. I'm asked almost every week to give an interview. So we, we don't feel an urgent need for, let's say, strategies in terms of public diplomacy. Whoever. <laughs> no. Just give it to someone. It doesn't matter who. Future of Germany. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's 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 quite a nice uh, question. Um, 
we are we are we we have started to be fairly optimistic. Uh, I think basically for the last two, three, four years, uh, we are seeing that we came out of this economic crisis of 2008 uh, much faster than our neighbors and that most other countries in the world. And one of the reasons was our social security system, which people don't believe, but it is simply the case. Um, and also globalization is something which really plays into the German cards since this is a very, kind of very decentralized economy that we are having all these here famous hidden champions or medium-sized companies. They are very highly profiting from, uh, from globalization. And at the same time, we see that our universities, which have always been very competitive, but to some extent uh, too, well, too restrictive, uh, too, too administrative in their approach, with the result that many people in natural sciences, but also in economics and in other fields, they left, they went to the United States, they went to the UK and to other countries. Many of them are coming back. And on top of that, we see that many researchers, many young people from all over Europe are coming into Germany. And in that sense, um, my guess is that uh, Germany will even develop stronger into a high-tech country, uh, into a country which is one of the country's leading technological and society, societal development. Um, and at the same time, that we'll, we'll be able to manage this big challenge of integrating people from all over Europe and to some extent from, uh, also from other continents. I think we have 30,000 Chinese students and they are growing by several thousand every year. So it will not take long before we reach the 50,000 <laughs> 50, level. Um, if, I'm, if I'm looking at the situation of my children, um, when my youngest son did his, his bachelor, his high school exam, there was still quite a lot of pressure on them. Um, still the youngest who did it, who will do it in two weeks' time, yes, he's, he's some pressure, he wants to be better than his brothers. But the difference is, the people that finished university 10 years ago, even seven years ago, they had difficulties to find a proper job. So there was quite considerable unemployment, even in the academic sector. But now the population...